Jesus is alive. He is not dead, but he today, right now, is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over all eternity, upholding the universe by the word of his power. And he is watching out for you. That's who's on your side today. Not some weak, frail, skinny, beaten down, defeated Christ. No, we serve a risen Savior today. And he is returning one day for me and hopefully for you. If you belong to Christ, he's coming for you. And that's good news for you today. God bless you. Thanks for being here with us at Destiny today. We'll see you next. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Hey, last week I started a message. Well, I, I had a message for you uh, from Judges chapter 3. And God's just given me this message from Judges chapter 3 called The Heart of a Warrior. And I was going to bring it to you last week, but as I got up here, uh, I just felt the Holy Spirit leading me in a little bit different direction to go to uh, Joshua chapter 1 and to look at who Joshua was and, and this leader that he was. And so I didn't end up getting to the message that I had planned last week. And so my plan was after going through the backstory last week to get to the message that God's given me uh, this morning. I was planning on bringing you that message this morning, but, but God has once again interrupted and intervened in my plans. I hope, well, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing that, that God leads us and directs us, but just, uh, it was so bizarre. I, I was coming here this morning. I was here this morning, and I'm walking down the hill, coming down to lead prayer. We have a prayer time at 9.30, and as I was walking down the hill, I just felt this completely and totally different message uh, come from the Lord. And so all this morning, I've been wrestling, you know, do I, do I give the message that I know is good? and that I've been marinating on and stewing on for a month? Or do I be obedient to the Lord this morning and give this other message that I, I really feel is for today? And so I'm gonna submit to the Lord. That's what we have to do, right? When the Lord speaks to us, we have to follow his leading. So I was gonna say open to Judges chapter three, but I'm not gonna say that this morning. Instead, I am going to say open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And why don't we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are alive and that we have relationship with you. Lord, you're a God who leads us and guides us and directs us. Lord, you speak to us. So, Lord, help me today to give the message that you want to communicate. Help me to give the message that these people here need to hear. And let it be effectual. And let it be powerful. And Holy Spirit, come and do a work in our hearts today. Transform us and make us more like Christ. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. So I sat down like three times during worship and scribbled a bunch of stuff on paper, and I'm up here looking at it, and I'm like, none of this even makes sense. So uh, that's all right. God created the world. We got three people that believe that. God created the world. Um, and God created humanity. He put humanity on the earth to be his representative God created you. He formed you. He fashioned you. He made you the way you are. And so if you don't believe that God is creative, you can just look in the mirror one day and say, wow, God, how did you come up with this? If, or if you don't believe God has a sense of humor, you can look in the mirror and say, wow, God. You know, some, you might say, God, I didn't know you were 
uh, such a that you were like Picasso, Pablo Picasso, when you put me together. This is such an abstract work of art that I am, God. This is amazing. God is the creator. He created you the way you are on purpose. It's not an accident the way you are. It's not random. The events of your life have meaning and they have purpose. That God has a purpose behind everything. Everything that we experience in life, and even the the great news about God is even the bad things we experience, the hurtful things, the things that are a result of sin that he didn't plan for us, but yet that we experience. The amazing thing about our God is that his promise for his children is that he's going to take those bad things and that he's going to work them for our good. And so whatever it is that that you've experienced in life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, God has a divine purpose for it. And if you will submit your life to God, he can take that hurtful place. He can take that sin that was done against you. He can take your mess, and he can turn it into a message for you to preach for, for, for your good and for God's glory. Now, how that relates to Exodus chapter 3, we're going to find out. And, uh, oh yeah, people, God, the God's the creator. Uh, humanity, though, sinned against God, left God, went away from God, abandoned God, rebelled against God, said, God, we want to go our own way. How many of you have ever said, I'm going my own way? You know, uh, Frank Sinatra used to sing this great song, I did it. My way. <laughs> That's humanity's song. We're doing it our way. And when you look at the world today, you can see a world doing it its way, not God's way. God's way brings life. He's the author and the giver of life. Man's way brings death, destruction. And so God, though, is a loving God, and he's a merciful God, and he's a gracious God, and he's a committed God. And so what God has done is, even though humanity rebelled against him, he has made a way for us to be restored to him, to be forgiven of our sins, to be redeemed, to be set free from the hurts of the past and that his resurrection power could be alive inside of us. And to accomplish all of that, he sent his son Jesus, who died on the cross and rose from the dead and made it all possible. But God, from the moment man, before even man sinned, God had a plan, and he still has a plan. So no matter what we see going on in the world We can never lose sight of the fact that God has a plan, that he has a purpose, and that he's perfectly, perfectly executing that plan and purpose. To bring Jesus into the world, God first called forth a people that would be his people of faith, his representatives on the earth. They were called the nation of Israel. God's design and plan for them was the same design and plan he had for humanity, that that when the world saw Israel, that they would see a reflection of the God that they serve. So that when the world saw God's people, that the world would get a glimpse of the God that those people serve. Today, the church operates in that same position. When people who don't know God see you, they should get a glimpse of the God that you serve. Because we are, we're like mirrors. We reflect the thing that we worship. We, we, humanity is, is this thing that there's something in us that, in our hearts that whatever we behold and whatever we gaze upon, we, we begin to become that. And so you can take a really good person and you can mix them up with a, a, a lot of bad people. And what's going to end up happening a lot of times? Right? What do we say? Bad company corrupts good morals, right? I mean, how many of you have people in your family that, man, they just started hanging around the wrong crowd? And what ends up happening? Well, 
they end up following in that path. How many of you have had the opposite happen? You, you've been hanging, you were hanging around some bad people and you got around some people that were lifting you up. They were heading the right direction and then what happens? There's something about humanity and it's the way that God created us and designed us is that we are like mirrors. We were created in God's image to reflect his glory. The problem is when we behold other things and we worship other things, we can worship anything, rock stars, the culture. We can put our children on a pedestal. If we worship the wrong thing, we're being conformed into the wrong image. And so what God did was he created, he, he called out this nation, Israel, that he was going to send his son through who would end up uh, making salvation available for the whole world, which today, salvation's available for anyone. It's a free gift. All you have to do is put your faith in Jesus. And the Old Testament in your Bible, the, the collection of books called the Old Testament, is the story of that family, of that nation, the nation of Israel. That's the Old Testament, the, the history of God working with humanity that ultimately culminated in Jesus Christ. And so the Old Testament looks back on the history of how man sinned, and God, but God, God created and man sinned, but yet God is a redeemer and a restorer, and he's faithful, and he's working, and he always keeps his promises. The New Testament's the story of how Jesus came and how he died for sin, how he rose again for you and me, how he ascended into heaven, and how one day he is returning. And the New Testament teaches us how to live in light of what Christ has done. But I want to show you something today uh, from Israel's history, this family that God had called out to bring his blessing to the world through. They had multiplied to a great number of people, yet they had become enslaved in bondage in Egypt. Egypt was using an entire class of people, an entire nation of people as slaves in bondage. And Israel, the people of God, they began to call out to God, Lord, set us free, save us from this oppression that we're in. And what we see is that God does not ignore their prayer. God did not ignore their prayer. Now, he didn't answer their prayer immediately. They were in Egypt, I think, if my memory serves me correct, for 400 years. And I'm not going to go into why it was 400 years. I don't have time for that today. But what we see is that, that God is on his own timetable. He's never on ours. God is, he's working his plan his way, which is a good thing for you. Trust me. Because you don't want it to go any other way than God's way. God, after 400 years, answers their prayer. Now, some of you get upset when God doesn't answer your prayer in four minutes, right? You know, I believe that there are prayers that you, prayers that you're, you are praying today that you will not see the fulfillment of. That doesn't mean that God is not good. That just means that in your natural eyes, you, you won't see the answers for them. That doesn't mean your children won't see them or your children's children won't see them. I believe today that I benefit today for prayers that were prayed over my life before I was even born by men and women of God who were praying for their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. God operates on a different set of rules, a different set of timetables. He's not con confounded by time and space like we are. He's outside of time and space. He created time and space. So the Bible tells us what to, to the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. That's a, one, one, a thousand years goes by like that for God. Some of you are sitting there thinking, how long is this sermon going to be today? I can't wait to get to lunch. Seems like we've been here for a thousand years already this morning. 
God operates on a, on a different plane. He sees, God sees all of history at one moment from the beginning to the end. The Bible says he's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. That's all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere at one time. And so we cannot confine God and, and force him to work the way we think he should work by our tiny little three-pound brain. It doesn't work that way. And so God hears Israel's prayer after 400 years. He raises up a leader, a man named Moses. Now, Moses has an interesting story. How many of you have an interesting story? Moses had survived as an infant a mass execution of babies. The king of Egypt had decreed because Israel was multiplying too quickly. The king of Israel had decreed that it was illegal for Israelites to have a male baby. And so the soldiers marched on Israel and murdered the male babies. The same thing happened when Jesus was born. Did you know that? When Jesus was born, the king, uh, king Herod tried to, to wipe out the male babies. Because when Satan kind of get, can get wind of when something's happening. And so he tries to bring opposition, and he tries to bring, uh, he tries to thwart the plan of God. But the plan of God cannot fail. The plan of God will not fail. And I just think it's, I just think it's so interesting that when God wants to do something new and amazing, that Satan starts killing babies. When we look at our nation today, what have we seen over the last 50 years? The bloodshed of babies. An entire generation of babies have been wiped out through abortion. You think that's a coincidence? I think God wants to do something amazing in the earth in these days. And Satan's trying to do everything he can to stop it. And so Moses escapes his mom <laughs> in an act of desperation. She puts him in a basket and places him in the river because she can't bear to watch her son killed at the hands of these Egyptian guards. And so she places that baby in a basket and places it in the river and says, God, have your will, have your way. That baby is Moses, and he, is in the, he ends up being found by the princess of Egypt, and he's raised in Pharaoh's house as a Jew. The people that Pharaoh was trying to wipe out, he's end up raised and educated in Pharaoh's house. The best education, the best schools, the best meals. At the age of 40, Moses sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite. He gets mad about it. So he rises up and he kills that Egyptian soldier who's beating that Israelite. And he has to run. He has to flee into the wilderness and escape for his life at the age of 40. Moses was a murderer. You think you've done some bad stuff. You think you've done some stuff in your past that disqualifies you from God using you. Moses was a guy who was put in a river, who was raised as a prince, but he wasn't really a prince. He was really a slave. He ended up murdering someone and runs out into the desert to escape for his life. And so he spends, Moses spends the next 40 years of his life taking care of sheep. That's like going from being, well, I don't want to equate what it is, but
The prince of Egypt taking care of a few sheep on the backside of the desert, totally forgotten. And this is where God calls Moses. While he's taking care of sheep in Exodus chapter 3, Moses sees something strange. He sees a bush that's on fire. Now, that might not be strange, but the strange thing was that this bush that was on fire, the fire never burned out. And so, upon seeing this strange thing, Moses goes to examine it. What is this strange thing that I see? And when Moses goes up to this burning bush that won't burn out, guess what happens? The bush talks to him. And that's not even the strangest thing to me of this story. The strangest thing is that when this bush that won't burn out talks to Moses, Moses talks back to it. I, 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 mean, I, I mean, I guess, well, what do you do? I mean, if a bush talks to you, I guess you just answer back. This was God appearing to Moses. The Bible equates God to a consuming fire that is unquenchable. God appears to Moses as a burning bush. And in verse 7 of chapter 3, God says to Moses, he says, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry. Because of their taskmaster, taskmasters, I know their suffering. If you're here today and you're suffering, God sees it. It hasn't escaped him. It's not that he doesn't see you. God knows what you're going through, and he cares about it. Just because we experience bad things doesn't mean that we serve a bad God. See, Satan wants to come and lie to you and say, if you served a good God, you'd only ever experience good things. It's a lie. We, we experience things in life. We can't interpret God based on our experiences. We have to go to his word and see what he has taught us. He hears they're suffering. I know they're suffering. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good land, to a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, I've never had milk and honey before. I think maybe one day I'll go home and try that. But it sounds pretty good, right? A land flowing, it, it's a plentiful land, it's a beautiful land. God's plan for his people is to set them free from bondage and move them into prosperity and move them into victory and move them into a life of, of overflow and blessing. That's God's plan for his people. That's God's plan for you. He says, verse 9, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that's the king of Egypt, the most powerful man on earth at this time. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Wow, what a call. God has appeared to Moses. I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a divine task for you. I need you to lead my people out of Egypt, out of bondage. What an amazing experience that Moses is having with God. Now, Moses' response to God. He doesn't say, yes, Lord, that sounds amazing. Where do I sign up? What do I start doing? Where do I go next? Who do I talk to? No, that's not what Moses does. That's not what many of us do when we feel God's call on our life. No, what Moses does is what we typically do and say to God. Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses says, who am I that I should do this? I'm disqualified. I failed. I'm old. He's 80 years old. Who am I? Isn't there somebody better? Isn't there somebody more qualified? Isn't there somebody more equipped? My, my resume isn't what it should be. 
How many of you have ever felt God's calling on your life and you've said, God, I, I just can't. I'm not good enough. I'm not the right man for the job. God, I think you dialed the wrong bush this morning and you, you meant to get that other guy on the other side of the desert. God, is this a prank call today? God, you've made a mistake. Listen to how God responds to Moses' inadequacies. Moses is saying, I can't do it, God. It's too big for me. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have what I need to be able to do this. Verse 12, God says to Moses, but I will be with you. You see, what we do is we make it all about ourselves. Moses is taking the call of God, and he's making it about himself. God says, Moses, it's not about you. It's about me, and I will be with you. God doesn't argue with Moses. He doesn't say, yeah, you're right. He doesn't try and convince Moses and say, no, but you're really good, and, and I've, I've really got good things for you, and, and let me tell you why I think that uh, you're good enough, Moses, you know, God, the truth is, Moses wasn't good enough. But it didn't matter because God was with him. So all of the things that you're saying about yourself for why you can't do what God's called you to do, they might be true. But at the end of the day, if God has called you, he's also promised to be with you. And that's all that matters. Because it's not about you. It's about him and his power at work in you. And that is a good thing. The reason Moses could go forward with confidence wasn't because he had the right tool set. It was because he had the right presence. And what did Jesus say before he left? When he sent his church on the mission, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations, and I will be with you. And through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the believer's life, we have that same power, that same authority, that same abiding with you presence of God. You've got it. You've got everything you need to accomplish everything God's called you to accomplish. Because you've got him. Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? And here's, the, here, listen, God's for you. God's for you. God's for you. Moses was placing his identity in who he was. And so we all do that. We all, we all find our value. We all get our self-worth from who we are or who we think we are, the things that we do or don't do. But for the believer, for the Christian, for the people of God, our value is not placed, our identity is not rooted in who we are. It's rooted in who is with us. Who you are is not as important as who is with us with you. Who, who God is speaks into who you are as his children. You know, we live in a world where our relationships are performance-driven. Our relationships are performance-based. How many of you at work, if you don't perform, your relationship with your boss isn't so great? Right? Your relationship with your boss isn't based on love and charity and grace, and right? It's performance-based. Most of our relationships, unfortunately, are performance-driven. It gets really bad and really unhealthy when a marriage relationship becomes performance-driven. So if she does what I like, then I love her. Or if he does the right things for me, if he performs the right way, then I'll show him love. But if he doesn't, well, then, he's not living up to this performance-based relationship that we have. Most of us have performance-based relationships in our lives. 
Your relationship with God is not like that. Your relationship with God is not a performance-based relationship. Your relationship with God is not based on the things that you do. Your relationship with God is based on who he is. Your relationship with God is not based on your performance. Your relationship with God is based on Christ's performance for you. And God bestows his love and his grace upon you because of what Christ did for you. Your relationship with God is not based on your desire for him. It's based on his desire for you. You are a Christian today because God loves you, because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. What the enemy loves to do is come and bring the voice of condemnation that says, when's the last time you read your Bible? Oh, three days ago, God hates you. God is not like that. Your relationship with God is not performance-based. Or I should say it's not based on your performance. It's based on what Christ has done for you. So God is a God of love and a God of mercy and a God of grace. And we try and make it about ourselves. I'm not good enough, and God could never love me, and I've done too much bad stuff, and blah, 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 blah. It's not about that. It's about who he is. And we place our identity in the wrong things. We get our value from the wrong things. We have to, as Christians, get our value, our identity. It has to be rooted in who our dad is, who our father is, who our heavenly father is. My children receive their identity. They are being shaped and molded by who their father is. You understand that? God is our Father. And He is a good Father. And He is a loving Father. And our relationship with Him, my, my, so for me, my relationship, my daughter's relationship with me is based 100% on who I am. 100%. What she does does not affect my love for her. And I have imperfect love. If it's not a performance-based relationship. It's not if, if she doesn't um, clean up her room, she ceases to be my daughter. That's not the way it works. Do you understand that? Too many Christians live on this, this, this fence or this teeter-totter of, if I don't perform the right way or do the right thing, I'm going to lose the relationship I have with God. And that's just simply not true. There's nothing that my daughter can do to change the fact that she is my daughter. She is my daughter for life. Good, bad, and the ugly, I am committed to her. And my love is imperfect. God has perfect love for you. Now, certainly, within the household, there are certain rules, and there are blessings to be bestowed for doing the right thing and discipline to be bestowed for doing the wrong thing, but it doesn't change who I am at the core of my being. I am a child of God. And this is good news because if my relationship with God was based on who I am, I would be in big, fat trouble if it was based on my emotions or what I felt like doing one day to the next, man, sometimes I'm all over the map. Sometimes I love something, and then two days later, I can't stand it. We, our, our relationship with God is based on his unending love. He never changes, and he bestows this gift of family 
to anyone who would put faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And so I have an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, because of who my father is. An inheritance is based on work that somebody else did for you. Right? You you understand? An inheritance is something that's given to you based on somebody else's work. You didn't earn it. So because of who my dad is, because of who my heavenly father is, I have an inheritance to receive. Salvation is part of that. But there's also other gifts and other blessings and other things that God wants to bestow upon his children. We have to realize who our father is. We, we have to come to him in faith, realizing that he loves us. Sometimes we beat ourselves up so much over the littlest thing, and God is saying, I love you. I care for you. I want to bless you. And so the only reasonable response to the grace of God shown in Christ is to fall on our face and worship him and praise him for everything that he's done for us in Christ. He's called us out of the world. He's called us out of a life of brokenness. He's called us out of a life of sin. He's called us his own sons and his daughters. He's given us a divine plan, a divine purpose. Blessings more than we could count. The only reasonable response to a God like that is to fall down in devotion and worship. And to just open up our arms and say, I want to receive everything my Father has for me. 